My presentation today is called, Are We in a Simulation? And a theme of this presentation is that things are changing fast. The purpose of the talk in general is mostly for my team here at Quantum Gravity Research and the people who support us here in our scientific mission, but it's also for anyone watching the movies, the videos that will be made from this, who tend to follow our work. A thought is a powerful thing. It's an object that pops out of consciousness and it can be very causal in the physical world. A certain horrible thought got manifest by some guy's consciousness into physicality that caused six million Jews to die in the 1940s. A more cool thought written on a blackboard, the Schrodinger equation, changed the world and led to the digital revolution and strong AI. So thoughts can become physical or influence the physical world. The self-simulation hypothesis and its underlying emergence theory, quantum gravity framework, will be more psychologically and physically powerful than either of these thoughts. Statistically, it's an impossible dream that we can introduce a viral new thought that changes the vector of society so profoundly that it defines how we evolve going forward into the rest of the universe from this point. But let's do it anyway. Every great dream begins with a dreamer. Reach for the stars, change the world, Harriet Tubman. Don't be afraid to dream of achieving the impossible, Shalane Flanagan. Dream the impossible. Know that you are born in this world to do something wonderful and unique. Don't let this opportunity pass by. Give yourself the freedom to dream and think big, Shankar. So many of our dreams at first seem impossible, then seem improbable, then when we summon all the will, they soon seem inevitable. Christopher Reeve. So I was inspired to start quantum gravity research, which in and of itself is a very improbable thing, right? Me trying to think about starting a quantum gravity group sounds about as likely as a plumber deciding he's gonna be a brain surgeon with no education. It was a book that led me to dream big. I started thinking about the ontology of energy and the nature of reality itself. That book, The Singularity is Near. And it eventually led to our mission statement at QGR to discover the geometric first principles unification of space, time, energy, information, and consciousness. It was a sunny day in Palo Alto 13 years ago at NASA's Ames Research Center. Along with 30 others, like Larry Page from Google, we were discussing the mission of Singularity University, which was about to be set up on the NASA campus in this building. So I financially supported the establishment of Singularity University, and then I went back to Los Angeles to form Quantum Gravity Research. The term singularity in this context is what you see in the Matrix, or Terminator. It's the point at which computers become sentient and take over their own self-evolution by writing their own code updates. Sort of like what humans are about to do as we use CRISPR and other technologies to hijack the formerly slow evolutionary process of the survival of the fittest and the gene mutation approach. Now we will hijack the rate over time of our evolution and the bespoke direction of evolution now that we can modify our own genetic code. Lately, I've been dividing my time between Irwin Naturals and quantum gravity research because I'm trying to acquire a greater amount of money to donate to a massive expansion of our cosmological model and the quantum gravity framework that undergirds it and related work, such as work in quantum computation. The older you are, the more you've been exposed to earlier rates of exponential change. This gives you a hidden bias to project longer than realistic dates for the emergence of this or that technology or knowledge. This talk will be edited into a few videos and published online for our followers. The outline is as follows. I'll first try to wake us up with some doom and gloom, some good old fashioned doom and gloom. The world and our personal lives are very noisy 
at least for me, it's easy to go into a numb state about all of the trauma in the world and the scary things and basically lose my bearings about how time sensitive things are right now at this juncture. So I want to instill in us an even stronger sense of primacy of mission here at QGR. After, I will relate our scientific mission to this exponential change that's part of the theme of, of today's talk. And I will do some foundational overview after of the fundamental axioms that undergird our work here. And at the end, I will correlate our approach to deep learning neural net architectures in strong AI. So, we'll start with the doom and gloom. We're in a foot race right now between two very fast runners that are increasing their rate of speed as they run toward their goals. One of the runners is the coming collapse of our ecosystem, and the other runner is a fundamental understanding of our universe, an understanding that can lead to a new cosmology that could influence our behavior, that is, could influence the other runner. Cosmologies are overarching theories of reality. They try to explain the origin of how we got here. And like any theory, they are stories or forms of mythos. Our physical cosmological stories include philosophies that are called ontologies. Ontologies are philosophies about what is real and what is not real. And these ontologies about what is real and not real influence how we behave collectively. One of the biggest tasks of quantum gravity research is stimulating a global debate over a cosmological theory called the self-simulation hypothesis. On the scary side of the race between societal collapse and transcending our destructive ways, we have man-made climate change. It's increasingly driving us toward political instability. And we've only seen the tip of the iceberg in terms of this political instability. For example, now that Antarctica is melting very rapidly, the major nuclear superpowers are squaring off to battle for who will lay claim to the oil and gas under the melting ice sheet. Political instability maps to the level of polarization between right and left leaning people. When times are good, the two worldviews live in relative peace. Environmental collapse leading to food shortages, economic destabilization from climate change, population growth, and oppression are accelerating. Times are bad and getting worse. These instabilities breed more violent political polarization that grows like cancer, leading to more power for those seeking short-term gains by accelerating the environmental collapse that helped to catalyze it in the first place. We're in the first major war in Europe since the 1940s, but this time it is between two nuclear-armed superpowers. It is a worldwide war using the 21st century weapons of energy, food, and information technology restriction. It's a proxy war of the US and the West in general with Russia. We have just experienced the first global scale pandemic. Things are changing faster. There never was a global scale pandemic. There were global scale flus. And then the dangerous diseases of the past occurred during periods when international air travel was either non-existent or very minimal. Species extinction is accelerating exponentially. Since 1972, industrial fishing has already made 90% of large fish extinct. Rapid extinction of coral reefs is the most serious thing in the oceans because they are home to 25% of marine life and the other 75% are dependent on them. We've achieved a full 50% kill-off of the planet's coral reefs so far, and the last 50% is dying at a much faster rate than the first half. 
Fish population reduction will impact global food supply, which will trigger more nationalism and totalitarianism that tends to favor faster environmental destruction. The extinction of the lungs of the planet, our rainforests, is accelerating. It's dangerous because half of all land species live there. And trees slow runaway global warming by soaking up and storing greenhouse gases. We passed a threshold last year in the largest lung of the planet, the Amazon rainforest. It now emits more greenhouse gas than it absorbs. Things are changing faster. We've already achieved a full two-third destruction of the planet's rainforests, and we are accelerating the burning of the remaining one-third. The majority of our crops and related destruction of rainforests are for meat production, not plants that humans eat. We've recently surpassed 40% of Earth's land-based biomes flat out destroyed. And we've done that mostly to produce monocrops that are not synergistic with the rest of the biosphere. We're burning down symbiotic ecosystems to feed our voracious appetite for meat. There are 10 million species here on Earth, and one of them, us, just destroyed 40% of the biomes on land and is working at industrial speed to kill off the last 60%. We are voraciously destructive, like locusts. Bees are a linchpin of the biosphere. When they go, we're in trouble. Bee farmers reported a die-off of 45% from April 2020 to April 2021. When the global biosphere reaches a certain point of no return, society will collapse into a Mad Max world. Some humans will survive, but it won't be fun. Thankfully, we in this room have grown up in a relatively stable world. And this is because the biosphere is resilient to damage. Like how you can remove blocks from a Jenga tower and it doesn't come crashing down. Until it does. Our global mythos makes it okay for us to conquer nature. You conquer enemies, so our mythos makes nature our enemy, at least according to our collective behavior. China is very open about their long-term national policy. They want to financially and militarily dominate the world. But so does the US, so does Russia. Everybody, every nation would if they could. But China is doing an excellent job at it. They will have the largest economy within a mere seven years. And they are hell-bent on using that money to catch up with the total 10,000 nuclear warheads that the US and Russia have between the two nations. And just like the US, which has done more damage, China's behavior implies they do not care about the collapse of our life support system, Earth's biosphere. They have been excellent students of the West's industrial scale destruction. NATO is growing larger and investing in more weapons of mass destruction. The world is moving into higher gear ramp up because resource limitation does strongly imply to anyone who observes politics and socio-political structures that it's looking a little more likely that there can be a major war among superpowers than maybe it looked, you know, 10 years ago. So as we consume the last remnants of the biosphere that support us, the 195 nations of this earth will get increasingly aggressive about who gets to gobble up the dying remnants. 
Countries like the US will literally kill to get their bigger share. So is World War III probable? Well, that totally depends. Will mankind change its mythos in mass in the near term? The current mythos is one where nature is our enemy to be conquered and mutilated. Increasing GDP and financial dominance over other humans is the standard mythos, almost without exception, among the 195 countries of Earth. The general policy of humans and their institutions is service to themselves or to their group. Not much service to future generations, right? You know, we don't really think about a better world for our grandchildren. We think about lower interest rates next month and every, everything we can do right now. And a given nation or tribe or group of people is also not so much in service to other tribes or nations or groups of people. And so that behavior, that focus on the self or the group, the group of yourself, that is pretty much the one unifying political feature of the US, China, Russia, and the other 192 countries. Conquer the biosphere at all cost and hurry up because others are feasting off of it already and you don't want to be left out. Selfishness with a sense of urgency is what I would describe it as. It's kind of like looting, which is selfishness with a sense of urgency, right? You got to loot before others get it or before the cops come, right? You got to get in there and loot while the getting's good. The race is accelerating to compete for the dwindling land and ocean resources, whether that be energy in the form of calories, fossil fuels, or elements such as neodymium that are used in high-tech applications. Other than ideological conflict, like that between religions or the philosophies of capitalism and communism, what is the most popular reason for mass destruction via war? Resource competition, fighting for what's left. The current mythos grounded in materialism is based on this. The whole setup has been metastable for most of our lives, even though we have lived in an era where we have been observing it getting worse. It's been metastable. There's no Mad Max world around us, at least not here in the United States. But there is an imminent tipping point or collapse where the House of Cards does come tumbling down. So it's a doomed path that worked okay for the 20th century as we destroyed parts of the biosphere, like how you can cut off a chunk of your flesh and rely on other cells around it to self-organize and seal up the void and compensate. So now we're getting down to the last critical Jenga blocks and the superpowers are gearing up mentally and physically for war. The rampant surge in worldwide nationalism means that it's not just the government and the elite. The masses are the ones destroying the biosphere and supporting the nationalists and dictators who make laws not just to allow it, but to promote it. We're on a countdown that is no longer multi-generational, but at the scale of our lifetimes. So pick your favorite Hollywood apocalypse movie. We've got viral apocalypses, global warming apocalypses, nuclear apocalypses, socioeconomic apocalypses, and food shortage apocalypses. The only one I left off was zombie apocalypses. When I was born, Earth's population was 3.2 billion and we had already done a lot of damage to the biosphere by that point. Plenty of Jenga blocks had been precariously slid out of the foundation even back then. In what feels like the blink of an eye, we are now at 8 billion people and the devastation to the environment is significantly worse. Things are changing faster.